In this video tutorial, we're going to continue looking at complex loading examples, except this time we're going to be looking at complex loading in three dimensions. So in the top left hand corner, we have a diagram of an object, and that object has a length of 140 millimeters and a cross sectional area 35 millimeters by 35 millimeter square. We can also see from the diagram that we have three stresses being applied. We have a stress in the x direction, sigma x, and we have stresses in the y and z directions, sigma y and sigma z. It's also worth noting at this stage that sigma z is actually a compressive stress. The stress is being applied inwards to the block rather than the tensile stress is being applied in the x and y directions. So sigma z is compressive, sigma y and sigma x are tensile. In the bottom left hand corner we have some information about the material first of all. It has an elastic modulus of 205 gigapascals and a Poisson's ratio of 0 0.29. And we have our three stress values being applied, sigma x 110 megapascals, sigma y 72 megapascals, and sigma z negative, because it's compressive, 85 megapascals. We discussed the conventions in the previous video, whereby compressive stresses are negative and tensile stresses are positive. In the top right hand corner, I have the equation that we're going to use in order to calculate the strain in the x direction. And the reason I haven't written the full equation out for the strain in the y direction and the z direction is because we can make comparisons in order to derive those equations. So you'll see here that when we're calculating the strain in the x direction, the stress that appears on its own in the formula is the stress in the x direction and the remaining two stresses sit inside a bracket because they're multiplied by the Poisson's ratio. So the full effect of the stress in the x direction is felt but only a proportion of the stresses and the y and z directions are felt and cause a strain in that x direction. So when we evaluate the strain in the y direction, we simply substitute the stress in the x direction with the stress in the y direction, and we replace the sigma y with sigma x. Okay, so let's begin by calculating our three strain values, and then we can determine the change in volume of this block. We're going to approach this in a couple of different ways, as you'll see throughout this video. So first of all then, epsilon x is one over our elastic modulus, and once again, we need to remember that this is times 10 to the 9 because we have gigapascals. Our stress in the x direction is 110 megapascals, or 110 times 10 to the 6. And from that, we're subtracting the Poisson's ratio times our stresses in the other two directions. 72 times 10 to the 6 for the y direction. Now note here we have plus negative 85 megapascals, so we can just write that as minus 85 times 10 to the 6. Adding a negative number is the same as subtracting that number. Now running that one through the calculator gives us a strain in the x direction equal to 5.54976. and that's times 10 to the minus four. Recall that strain is dimensionless, so there's no units for that. That answer there is correct to six significant figures. Let's repeat for epsilon y then. And once again, we have one over the elastic modulus. Now this time, the first term in the bracket needs to be our stress in the y direction because the full effect of that stress is felt. So 72 times 10 to the 6 minus the Poisson's ratio, 0 0.29, times, this time, we need sigma x and sigma z, the remaining two stresses. Sigma x is 110 times 10 to the 6 plus minus 85 megapascals. So the same as before, we can just subtract 85 times 10 to the 6, giving us a strain in the y direction equal to 
And once again, that's times 10 to the minus 4. And finally, the strain in the z direction. Now the strain in the z direction is 1 over the elastic modulus. The first stress in the bracket needs to be our stress in the z direction. And once again, we need to take care to include our negative. So we've got minus 85 times 10 to the 6 minus the Poisson's ratio times the stress in the x direction. This time it's the x and y directions in this bracket. So 110 times 10 to the 6. And this time it's plus because our stress in the y direction is positive. And running that through the calculator gives us a strain in the z direction equal to minus 6.72098. Once again, times 10 to the minus 4. Okay, so we're going to make a note of our three strain values at the top of the screen. Then we're going to determine the change in dimensions in the x, y, and z directions. And then from there, we can calculate the new volume of the block and hence the change in volume. This is the first approach that we're going to use to calculate the change in volume of the block. The second approach is going to be by first calculating something called the volumetric strain. Okay, so now we have each of our strain values. What we can do next is calculate the new lengths in the x, y, and z directions as a result of the stresses that are being applied. And hopefully you'll recall from the previous video that length equals the strain multiplied by the original length add the original length. Effectively what we have here is the change in length plus the original length to give the new length. And I'm going to add a subscript here because we're going to do the x direction first. And when we do the x direction, we need to use the strain in the x direction. So for the new length in the x direction then, we have the strain in the x direction, which is 5.54976 times 10 to the minus 4. We need to multiply that by the original length. Well, the original length in the x direction was 140 millimetres. We can work in millimetres as long as we remember that the final length that we're calculating is also in millimetres. To that we're going to add the original length, giving us a new length equal to 140.0777 millimetres, and that's accurate to four decimal places. We'll work to four decimal places this time. Same for the y direction then. We have the strain in the y direction. And our dimension for the y direction is 35. And we need to add on the original length, giving us a new length in the y direction or a new dimension in the y direction equal to 35.0111 millimeters to four decimal places. And finally, z direction, we have the minus 6.72098 times 10 to the minus 4 times the original dimension of 35 plus the original dimension, giving us a new length in the z direction equal to 34.9765 millimetres. Now note from these results that we have a lengthening in the x and y directions because both of those dimensions are larger than the original dimensions, but we have a narrowing in the z direction. So the final step here is we're going to calculate the new volume by multiplying our x, y and z dimensions together. And then once we've found the new volume, we can subtract the original volume to find the change in volume. So let's do that now in order to determine the change in volume of this block as a result of those three stresses. Okay, so our new volume then can be calculated as follows. We have 140.0777 times 35 
0.0 treble 1 times 34.9765, giving us a new volume equal to 171,534, and that's going to be cubic millimetres because each of our dimensions are in millimetres there, and that's accurate to the nearest whole number. Note that there may be a slight error there due to rounding in our x, y, and z strain values and our x, y, and z dimension values. But we have used a decent number of significant figures there, so that answer should be relatively accurate. The final step then is to calculate our change in volume. And our change in volume is just the new volume minus our original volume. Our new volume is 171534 millimeters cubed. And our original volume is just 140 by 35 by 35. So our original volume then, calculating this part here, is 171500 millimeters cubed. Therefore, our change in volume then is 34 millimeters cubed. So what we can see there is we have quite a substantial change in volume, particularly when one of our lengths, our length in the z direction, is actually contracting. That's one method we can use to calculate the change in volume. We've found the strains, we've found the new lengths, the new volume, and then we've subtracted the original volume. But there is another way that's quite neat. What we can do is calculate something called the volumetric strain. And that's a method that we're going to use now. Okay, so volumetric strain is simply our three strain directions added together. Now the advantage of calculating our volumetric strain then is because a volumetric strain, much like strain in a linear direction, is change in volume over original volume. Therefore, if we calculate our volumetric strain, we can then calculate our change in volume by rearranging this formula. Change in volume is volumetric strain times original volume. So continuing with this example then, our volumetric strain is the sum of our three strain values. And adding our three strain values from the top there, epsilon x plus epsilon y plus epsilon z, gives us a volumetric strain equal to 1.9875. Times 10 to the minus 4. Note here that we're adding epsilon x and epsilon y because they're positive, but we need to subtract epsilon z because it's negative. This strain here is a negative value. Final step then is to calculate our change in volume. Change in volume is our volumetric strain of 1.98732 times 10 to the minus 4 times our original volume, which we've already said was 171,500, giving us a change in volume equal to 34.08 cubic millimetres. So we can see there that both of those methods are valid because they yield similar results. Both of these answers would be affected by rounding because we have rounded our epsilon x, epsilon y and epsilon z values but we have used a decent number of significant figures in order to minimize any errors caused. In the next video, we're going to look at one final example, except this time our block of material is going to be cooled. So we're going to have contraction of this object because when objects are heated, they expand, and when objects are cooled, they actually contract. So we'll look at how that affects the volume of the block in the next video.